Hey guys, Jan here. I am incredibly thrilled to say that I had the opportunity to host a panel with Jason M. Waltz, founder of Rogue Blades Entertainment, and two other authors, John C. Hawking and Joe R. Lansdale. In the panel, we'll be talking about the contribution the two authors have to the anthology and about being a writer. For lack of better words, it was pretty damn cool. But anyway, I'm gonna let these gentlemen introduce themselves because I think they'll do a much better job introducing themselves than I ever could. Hi, Jason Waltz, Rogue Blades Entertainment and Foundation. Uh, this is a interview with Joe Lansdale and John Hawking discussing their involvement in what's my retirement project, Neither Beg Nor Yield, an anthology of my kind of sword and sorcery, hard-hitting, indomitable characters with uh, nonchalant motivations. This is my swan song goodbye to the to the publishing world. I want to work on my own writing. Uh, it was very hard for me to write and edit all these years, and I, uh, in the last six, eight months, I've got the most sub submitted out there that I've ever had in my life. It feels good. feels good to write. I'm going to keep my hand in on the Rogue Blades Foundation side, maybe do large scale like the Hither Cam Conan and the Robert E. Howard Changed My Life books every three, four years maybe. Uh, but that's not a promise. That's a, that's a maybe. Hi, I'm, I'm John Hacking. I, I wrote a couple of Conan novels several, many years ago. Um, one of them got published. One of them still in the process of being published. And uh, last I heard, it's been delayed till next summer. So in addition to that, I've written a, a small stack of uh, sword and sorcery and horror stories that were published here, there, there, and yon. Um, Currently, uh, I just recently retired. I got much in the much like Jason, and uh, I swore to myself I'd try to write something long form since I'd written nothing but short stories for I don't know 15 years, and I so I've been working on a novel for about the past year. I'm about 80 percent done with it. We'll see what happens. It's an ongoing battle. Hell yeah! And uh, well, Lansdale, you you've got quite a career. I had no idea you wrote uh, Bubba Hotep. I'm a big Bruce Campbell fan, so oh, yeah? when, when I heard that, I was like, "Whoa, that's him! That's the guy! No way!" <laughs> that's the guy. So, no, I've I've written a lot of stuff. I've been I've been at it 50 years. I've been full time over 40, probably about 45 years, 46 years. Um, I've written novels and short stories and articles and essays and screenplays and uh, teleplays and animation, Batman the Animated Series, for example, Superman the Animated Series. I've done uh, Son of Batman and lots of other animation. A lot of my stuff has been adapted to love death and robots and other things of that nature. Uh, I've written uh, a Conan uh, series for uh, the comics. Um, songs of the dead which i had the tremendous artist tim truman to work with and i've adapted pigeons from hell uh, really it was supposed to be a sequel it's not actually an adaptation it's a where things sort of repeat themselves in in the the future uh not the far future but maybe more the the present and uh I, i've written uh introductions to howard's work i've written about howard I've been to Howard Days. I've been a guest there, oh, and uh, but I mean, I've been at it a long time. Just put it like that. I'm I've done a lot of stuff. Oh yeah. I, and I should direct films. So it looks like so. I'm in my seventies. So I'm waiting for retirement when I'm ninety-two. <laughs> I didn't want to mock him. Everybody thinks that the way you do it is you mock the guy. You can't beat Howard at his own game, and you shouldn't try. You know, Robert E. Howard's Robert E. Howard, and I'm Joe Lansdale for whatever that's worth. So I tried to capture Robert E. Howard, but I also brought probably more humor into the work than he would have. And uh, I tried to give it my kind of dialogue. And, uh, you know, I, I, I felt like I was honoring Howard by not trying to... Uh, you know, mimicking. I, I, I don't think I could have done that very well. And I don't, and even if I could have, there's, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a, a sort of self-defeating approach. They're going to hate you if you mock him. And then they're going to hate you if you, if you do it originally. So, and then when everything sorts out, then they decide they like it or they don't. I always find that, that the immediate response to anything you adapt isn't good. Um, so, uh, that if, based on you know something that's already existing but time sorts that out and it sorted it out pretty good for me on songs of the dead yeah 
Yeah, yeah I, I can't I can't help but agree with that one. I, I think a lot of people look to at pastiche as having to, to be some sort of attempt at duplicating Howard's effects. When I think at its best, pastiche is more of a tribute than a straight up imitation. So right on. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, that, that's actually interesting. I was actually going to ask. Like, so you never were both of you. You never were like. I don't know if like stress is the right word. You were never worried about what like fans may think. You were just trying your best to do a love letter to his work. Definitely a love letter to Howard, um, the Conan character, and Weird Tales magazine, which is the greatest genre magazine of all time, as far as I'm concerned. Us doing it as a, I, w I was taken aback a little bit when uh, the Conan the Emerald Lotus was published. This was before the officially sort of sanctioned, re you know, sort of restored Howard was available. And so I got a good number of, of, of poison letters about me daring to write anything in, in Howard's realm. Um, so it was, I got a mixed bag out of that. I pleased myself by writing what I thought was a sincere tribute to, you know, the stuff that I loved. And not everybody saw it that way. I tried to keep in mind Howard's spirit, but I write like everybody I know is dead. I don't care if they like it or not when I'm writing it. When I get finished, then of course I hope they do. But I think if I had that, you know, feel like somebody's looking over my shoulder while I work, I don't think that leads, at least for me, to a good work. Uh, I want something that's mine. When I get through, I hope they like it. And But ultimately, if their, their complaint is that it's not just Howard or I wrote Howard, I ah, fuck them. You know, I'm just going to keep doing what I do. Yeah, it's that uh, creative freedom, I guess. And do you think that comes with time? I've always been kind of a, a hard head about that. And, uh, um, you know, my early stories in the 70s, I wrote some sword and sorcery stories in the 70s, and they're pretty damn awful. And a couple of them were published in the 80s that I co-wrote with Ardeth Mehar that are a little better because she made them better. But uh, I'd always thought, if I ever get a chance, I want to write a, 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 a sword and sorcery story that's not... You know, just off the fumes of, of um, Robert E. Howard. I mean, he's a, he's established Robert E. Howard, and and a lot of people have imitated him. There, there are a lot of um, sword and sorcery writers that I really enjoyed, and then about 78, 80, I burned out on sword and sorcery because it was all the same thing. And uh, I, I never lost my interest in Howard, and I never lost my interest in, say, uh, Michael Moorcock, who, who was a, a you know a friend of mine is a friend of mine, and I liked Fritz Leiber's approach. I even liked uh, a couple of the others that were lesser known, but I just felt like that that we were running the same program over and over. So I thought if I ever get the chance, I'm going to go in at it my own way, and other people can sort it out if they don't think it's sword and sorcery or doesn't fit their pattern. I can live with that. Um, so when I did this one, I sort of brought what I thought was a more Lance Delian approach for work, bad, uh, good or bad, you know, and uh, so it was great to have that opportunity to write a sword and sorcery story that I felt was also my sword and sorcery story, and not just an imitation. Yeah, um, Jason, do you, do you feel that um, do you feel that sort of pressure of not trying to imitate what was great in the past, but also like evolve? Like, what are what, what were the challenges of like forming this team of people? Uh, with this anthology. The, uh, the kernel of where this came from was I was asked to write the foreword to another uh, sword and sorcery anthology from uh, another small press. Um, I had not announced my retirement at that time, but I had already determined it. And the third thing was I was getting really tired of the ongoing list of definitions that everyone keeps throwing out for uh, sword and sorcery, and they just seem to be getting longer as the years go by. Um, so put all those things together. I wrote my forward and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to say goodbye with one throat punch of a book that that I want to say this is my definition. I have always said from the beginning of time that sword and sorcery is an attitude, but I've never been called on the carpet by, for what that meant. So when I wrote this forward, I had to flush that all out and really determine what I meant. And then I said, so who will be in it? And you know what? Um, in 20 years of this and... 50 years of reading books, I didn't, I, I typed my list of names out right, right straight. I didn't have to sit and think. Um, I had, I had more names than I could put in the book, to be honest. Um, uh, about another five more in case these guys said no. And then I just sent out a tentative letter and I said, uh, if I do this, I think you're important and integral to it. I asked them to write to my definition, but 
it's not a hard, you know, I want stories from these guys because they write what I want to read. Every single one of these guys writes the type of material I like to read. And I, I wanted them to have the opportunity to write for this. Um, I'm calling this honestly. That's why I changed the title or the, the byline to say from Jason instead of edited by Jason, because I'm presenting this as a gift to the sword and sorcery community, in my opinion. So it was slightly challenging when a few of the stories came in. Steven Erickson, for example, told me straight up. Well, first he told me no. He doesn't write short fiction anymore. So I had to basically twist his arm, which is why he says he's even in the book, because I twisted his arm. Uh, uh, but then he told me straight up, I'm not going to write to your tropes, Jason. So, But he did give me what I wanted, even though he doesn't think he does. <laughs> did. <laughs> so there's been challenges because... Uh, I have to sometimes cock my head to look at the story, uh, but I'm getting what I want. Uh, sometimes not exactly the package I thought I was getting, though. I I never I, I like the Campbell stuff, but I never took that very seriously anyway about the hero's journey and this is how it's done. I I think that there's too many variations on that, and I also you had about uh, I I couldn't tell you how many people were suddenly using that as a pattern for books and stories and films, and it just got to be very, very tiring. Uh, and I don't think it's an absolute anyway. It's smart, it's interesting, and I enjoyed reading Campbell, but my take was I, I don't like labels to begin with, to be honest with you. And I think uh, I nailed it when he said attitude, because that's what I have as an attitude when I write. Uh, I, I try to say what's the attitude of a crime story even if it doesn't feel like a crime story to someone else or what's the attitude of a horror story what's the attitude of a sword and sorcery story or what more important to me and i say this not trying to be uh you know egotistical but just because of what i've learned what works for me is what is the attitude of a lansdale story that might fit into that groove you know, and there will always be those, oh, this isn't sword and sorcery, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that, nah, it's okay with me. And I feel that same way about all the other stuff, you know, I I remember uh, a very, very famous uh, writer who went on to be a multi-bestseller, well, is a friend of mine, and, and we were very much, we were much closer then, told me, say, you must never write like this, it's, it's too strange, it's too offensive, and all that and I said this is exactly what I want to do you know I'm not I'm not I'm not in the in the mindset that I'm trying to be the world's greatest bestseller I want to because I'm selling I mean you know I, I I've done quite well and it's been very financially lucrative to me maybe not if I had wanted to write the same book over and over and over so people could have the same experience over and over and over I didn't want that and what people forget, too, is that readers don't have the same time involved with creating something over and over and over. They uh, only spend like a couple of hours, a, a few hours, maybe a couple of days reading a book. But you're in it for months. And a short story, it's a, a shorter bit of involvement, but it's still not the same experience that they're having. It's a wonderful experience writing it. And hopefully, if it's good, you when you reread it at least once, which is what I try to do, then leave it, is that you have a good experience with it. But you're so time involved with something that if you're having to write the same book over and over and over, man, that's really going to you know, take a lot out of you. And I just didn't want to fall into that. So to me, I think attitude is a, a really good way of putting it. I mean, the attitude that, uh, that Jason describes, the somewhat uh, mercenary, um, almost nonchalance, is, for me, isn't necess for, forgive me, Jason. It isn't necessarily a fundamental, you know, flagstone of the sword and sorcery. I mean, is Solomon Kane nonchalant? Is Brand McMore? Uh, yeah, it 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 seems like that particular element of it is is part of it, and perhaps the part that Jason it resonates most with Jason. But I don't see it everywhere, and I don't think it's necessarily indispensable. And in my own story, my own contribution to to the anthology. That's not necessarily there, so, but the rest of it, I don't know, the passion, the speed, the, the, the pacing, the, the ferocity, the headlong clash between a sort of a qualified good and a nearly unqualified evil, that's that mythic power that, uh, that sword and sorcery can conjure when it's really cooking, that's, that's irreplaceable. That's the stuff, I, that's what I strive to do, and it's not necessarily easily. Uh, you watch Howard, he, he does it. Like that, like uh, like it, it, he he went to lunch and then wrote something, uh, wrote a myth 
I, I don't see how he did it, but that's why he's great. And, and I'm writing pastiche. Yeah. I, I want to point out that John was one of the first ones to get his story in. And uh, I had invited John. I, I, I like John's material, but if you have read uh, Book of Blades 1 uh, from Rogues in the House, he has the opening story in here. And that was like, that was literally a throat punch. Um, and so I had asked John for, the, for something like that. And he gave me a story that has a slower burn and gives you that at the end. So John was my first, cocked my head a little bit, and I'm like, okay, we're almost there. And John knew just by talking to me that there was a vibe, and he said, okay, what did, what did I do? So I asked John, can you change the, the pace of the – I don't want to give anything away. Um, yeah. Just up the pace a little earlier, basically. And – we discussed it, and he sat on it and worked on it for a little while, and then started to reach a point where I was concerned that he wasn't happy with it, and I wasn't going to get it back. <laughs> and then I did. And I think, John, and I told you this, I think it's night and day different. Uh, I, I, whatever little tweaks you did, and they were little, but you accelerated the intensity from the onset. And uh, he gave me what I wanted, and I believe you're happy with the end result and giving what you wanted out of the story. So. I was just going to say, I, I, I don't know if you guys have been out to the Howard House in Cross Plains. I have. Yeah. And uh, what I think is pretty interesting is that the back porch, um, used to be a back porch, became his study. They filled it in. And so he has a bookcase against the window that originally looked out of the bedroom over the porch. And that's where his mother stay that was her bedroom so he put a a bookcase in front of it but they have a desk there that replicates the desk that he had at that time and i remember sitting down in it and th thinking well, here's this guy lived in this and like me lived in out in the nowhere that had produced all of these stories and then died young i mean produced one story after another in that little narrow thing right and uh I was talking to Vincent D'Onofrio at one point, and, and he he did that great movie, The Whole Wide World, with uh, him playing Howard. And we both felt like here was a guy that suffered probably, you know, some form of mental illness. Uh, he had a lot of, he lived in an area where people didn't know what he was doing. I had the same thing. Nobody knew what that was. When I used to tell him I was a writer, they would go, Bulls? No, writer, not writer. So I used to have to explain that, you know, because people didn't know what that what that meant. Yeah. And so I, I, I just thought about that that guy sitting in that little place, you know, because it's not very big. It's, it's more long than it is wide. And he had that desk, and I can just think of him sitting there because what I had was like an old school desk that my mother gave me when I was uh, at home, and I'd go in that little school desk. That was my office. Once I got in there, that was my bubble. You know, I had the, the stuff on the desk, and I had a little place where I could stick it under the desk. And that was that was originally my office. You know, now I've got a, a, a regular office. And, and I had one time had a table, and I was writing, and you could see the rain coming through the roof and going down into the sink. While I was writing, you know, I remember my wife and I used to, to kid about that. We had our own waterfall, you know. <laughs> so I I just found that so amazing that, you know, like you were saying, here's this guy does this more <laughs> lunchtime, you know, or after on a lunch break or something. And uh, he was just am amazing at what he did. And, and I think, and I don't remember exactly, Jason, maybe you can help me, but I think you gave me a bit of advice to something I added to my story. It was just uh, because I had had the luxury of reading your first Greasy Bob story that came out in Shadows, uh, Swords in the Shadows. It was just a mention back to something that happened there that that was missing in that story so that new readers had it. Uh, it wasn't that big of a change. And yeah, you are going to enjoy um, a, a modern slash futuristic version of Sword and Sorcery. You, you mentioned that Howard lived in a very crummy room. His mother was right next door. Yeah, in, in the modern age where creatives have access to the internet, there's so much overload of information, yet in every forum I go, people are saying, oh, how do I tackle writer's block and stuff? Do you think it's a real issue? And how come Howard, like you guys mentioned, never didn't seem to really have that? All I can say is it's not a real issue with me. I, I don't try to answer for others. It yeah. may be okay. psychological problems. Most of the time, though, it's horseshit. Most of the time, it's that people won't sit down and write. They, they're they scared, and uh, those are things that are understandable. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a scary business, really. If I'd, if I'd known anything about the business, I 
I, I might not have done it if I'd have known how hard it was. Uh, but I was just out in the woods, and I never, I never met a writer or, or an editor or a, you know, an agent or anybody until I'd been selling for maybe eight or nine years. It just, you know, small things. But, but, uh, so to me, I maybe if I had known, it'd have been different. And I think when I was in Howard's little room, it was small, but it wasn't dismal. There was something really cool about that place, you know. And maybe it's my own psychological vibes that I added to it because it was Howard. But as far as like writer's block, I think he didn't have writer's block because he couldn't afford it. It. And I didn't have writer's block because I couldn't afford it. When I first really started, I wrote nonfiction and sold several nonfiction pieces. But when I first started writing fiction, I remember I had uh, was working in the rose fields and we were working, you know, really hot weather and then really cold, cold weather. And then we were working in icy weather and we just found a dead body. <laughs> so there was a lot of stuff going on right then. And uh, they said, well, we're not going to have any work for maybe a month. And my wife said, well, look, I've got this job loading lunch meat in this, this freezer car. And uh, why don't you take three months off and you write every day. But when I come home, you better have something written. So <laughs> I had a story written every day. I wrote a story a day for 90 days. And every yeah. one of those stories was pretty bad. And uh, but what I learned a lot from it, and I sent them out. It took me four years to get all the rejects back because back then you could send a story to 10, 15 markets. I mean, you would send stories out and there was another magazine. And then regular magazines like women's magazines, they bought stories. You know, and some of them were science fictional oriented. Bradbury was in things like that. And there were all kinds of places. And I'm sure I sent them to places that were just terrible. But again, I didn't know what I was doing. I got a writer's market and I looked up the list and sent them out. But over those four years, I literally got 1,000 rejection slips. I was getting 10, 15, sometimes more for, for one story. You know, it was going everywhere. And by the time of that, we heaped up a bunch of them and burned them. And I kept a few that were in like special volumes later. I, I didn't know that's what was going to happen. But then we gave out one of my rejection slips in, into all those limited, uh, the really limited volumes. And I, I kept the favorite ones of my own. I remember when I was writing for Sam Merwin for Mike Shane Mystery Magazine, I sent him a story. He wrote me a nice note. And I thought, okay, maybe I'm breaking. So I rewrote it. And he sent me a nice note back. But this isn't it. Then I wrote it again. He sent back, I, I hate this story more every time I see it. <laughs> <laughs> I write something new. And I did. And that one sold. Um, well, I can only speak for myself, obviously, yeah, but of I, know, I know writers blocks. I know writers blocks is real. Um, listening to Mr. Lansdale talk, that that the thousand rejection slips. That, that that's a, you're pretty ironclad there, sir. I, I know people have been shattered by one rejection slip. <laughs> so that, that's pretty. That's pretty mighty. Now, there's a lot of things that are going to discourage you from from writing. You know, there's you know, there, there's always something better to do than to face that blank page waiting for you to put something wonderful on it. But you know, once you get rolling, you know, uh, try to set, you try to set a goal for how many. Yeah, even something simple as how many words you're going to write that day. You know, it, maybe it's a, just a little. Maybe it's a trickle, and it, you start off and you start going somewhere. Doing a long, longer project rather than working on it straight chronologically, I might jump ahead to write a scene that I thought was cool. But I try to keep my keep, keep myself off balance and enthusiastic about whatever I'm writing. Um, I don't know. I guess one of the problems is that people stop being enthusiastic about what they're writing, and that's a different problem entirely. If you're not into it, then I don't know. Why are you doing it? I think, I think you hit on some things, too, you know, is that, like I said, I, this is, I'm speaking for me, you know, is that I think some people do have problems with psychological, but mostly I don't think think that's true. I think most people don't want to face that page, you know, and, and I, unlike what you said, to me, I, there's nothing I want to do more than face that page. That's what I'm wanting to do. That's what I was born to do in my own way. Obviously, I don't think I was born to be a writer, but everything fit together for me just right. And uh, I don't lack for confidence. You know, I don't think, uh, you know, I'm egotistical, but I have an ego. If I didn't have an ego, what the fuck am I doing? You know, <laughs> I've got to have some belief in myself to put stuff out there and I can take criticism. And uh, if I don't like it, I just don't do it. And if I like it, I go, okay, I'll change it. And, uh, or I'll do this. And, uh, you know, I, when I had so many rejections, they, all they did was make me mad. <laughs> and worst is I knew it was bad. 
I knew they were right. And I was getting better as I was gone, you know, and I, as, cause as every six months, when you start out, when you're early on, you, if you're writing regularly, you jump, you know, you, you find, Oh, I'm better now. And then you can look back at the old stuff that you thought was aces and go, Oh, I can't believe I wrote that. And I also found a key that works for me is don't try to write a bunch of stuff in one day. I work three hours a day on the average sometimes less and I get I have a thing I get three to five pages a day I don't think about it in terms of words but you know that so many words per page but I think three to five pages a day is enough and if I'm really cooking I might get 10 or 15 and it's rare that I ever get under three but for me if I extend and try to work all day I get diminishing returns that's no fun by then I do want to do other stuff you know uh, somewhere in there when you're growing up you have to have sex you have to raise children you have to feed the dog you know you got other stuff you have to do and I'm a martial artist I've been one for 61 years and uh, I so I have that to do although less these days I'm a, I am older I'm 72 here in a couple of months but for me you know by doing less time but more dedicated time I'm, I do better it, otherwise I get diminishing returns now when I first started I tried working much longer times and, and I did multiple drafts and I quit the multiple draft stuff I redraft as I write which means I may be doing a lot of drafts but I write and I correct it as I go which is why I love the computer Computer, and I just keep correcting. The next day, I reread re what I had written the day before, and I correct that. And then when I get to the end, there's no more drafts. There's a polish. Now, once in a while, I'll have something that needs more polishing than others. And now and again, I'll have something that's almost like a redraft because I, I missed the boat here and there. But most of the time when I do that, it takes a lot of the worry out of it because I'm not having to read the same thing over and over and over. I've done it as I go. And then when I get finished, I have a, less time. When I first started, I had multiple drafts and we did it in typewriter. So I had all these damn dr drafts everywhere, you know, and I'm like trying to sort this one and mark this one. I'm cutting stuff out with scissors and, and taping it on. I'm putting that white you know out on there it looked like the you know the walls of dover you know the cliffs but i had that stuff everywhere and i finally once i got to the computer i said i don't think this is the way i want to do this anymore because i have a new opportunity now and i was one of those guys that waited to to start on the computer because it slowed me down anything i had to relearn slowed me down for writing yeah. and on the other hand i spend a lot i got to have a lot of time off because i read I believe reading is the is more important than writing, you know, it, at least in the sense of learning how to do it. Once you start writing, of course, writing is more important, but just marginally. Because I, I used to read like three, four books a week. There was a period when I was reading one a day because I was reading a lot of old ace doubles and, and gold medal novels that are about 120, 180 pages long. And so oh, yeah. I did all that and I put, put all that stuff inside of me, which taught me how to do this stuff. It was my framework for learning how to write. And I, I'll I'll shut up. I've gone too long anyway. So no, no, no. That that's that's wonderful. I mean, I'll I'll tell you this. I agree with what you said about reading books. You know, I, I grew up in a particular time when we had all this other stuff of entertainment. A lot of my ki a lot of uh, people in my generation just sort of abandoned reading, and I was one of those people who abandoned reading. But after getting by into it in S and S, not only do you learn how to write, but sort of like especially if you have a really great book a really well crafted book it, it, it builds up your soul in a way i don't know how to, how to describe it it's a different vibe than when you watch like a great film or play a great game i'm not, exactly. sure, I'm not sure if i'm making sense but but no it makes perfect sense oh, yeah. where you're coming from john you said that you have made a brand new character for this anthology how much can you uh how much can you reveal without obviously spoiling anything? Well, I, I was thinking about what Jason wanted to have. I knew he wanted a passionate story, um, a, a, a story with, with, a, with a character up against serious odds and being indomitable about it. And what I wanted, to, I looked at it differently. I wanted to have a, a character who had previously been a powerful, strong individual and had been basically forced down to the lowest level and 
and had to fight his way back up. Um, so, someone who basically lost everything and in, in, in his way, lost his way. I don't want to again. Don't want to give too much out. Yeah. And uh, to the point where he was not serving his own best interests anymore. He was actually kind of, in some ways he's working against them. But uh, but yeah, I, I wanted I wanted the, the triumph to be him returning to his his former self to to his former strength. And um, the best way I could do that was it was in a uh, it had, the the stakes had to be personal for the character. They had to be they had to be family. And that's that's what I built it out of. Um, I ended up being pretty pleased with it. It's 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 a good companion to the story at the, uh, that starts off uh, Book of Blades, the one that uh, the one that caught Jason's attention and made him want to have my work in the collection. Yeah, um, I, what I wanted was a story that was really about style and attitude and different blending of science fiction and fantasy and stuff like that. I don't look at those two stories as saying, "Oh my God, I have really plotted myself." cool I, that's not what they are they're they're more they're almost like somebody just starts and they don't stop it just starts wheeling and stuff keeps coming in i think they make sense but they make sense within an unusual universe so for me those stories are not so much about plot they're about this sort of feel and attitude you know we're talking about attitude i think they're very very much stories with with attitude and i think when you get through with him you're kind of go what the hell was that <laughs> what, yeah. what what did i just read you know and i i'm i don't really want to see the sword swinger that's just really trying to get to that gym uh, so that he can kill the big lizard or whatever it is you know um after i've read that 10 or 20 times i've i've read it you know i don't want to read it anymore so it's either got to be about some delicious style you know or it's got to be about some new approach to it or ways of throwing a wrench in it, which I literally did. My guy uses so a wrench instead yeah. of a sword. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he's based on my father. In, in one way, my father was a mechanic, and he was a hard-as-nails kind of guy that born in 1909, lived through the Great Depression. You know, I always think it's weird when I tell people Mark Twain died the next year after <laughs> my dad was born and that wow. Bat Masterson and all of those people were alive, Wyatt Earp. Annie yeah. Oakley, uh, I think White Earp died in 1929 or something like that. But it's, but he had a certain personality that I tried to put into the story without trying to make it just like him. That you see that a lot of these S and S characters, there is this human drive to uh, for adventure, to carving out your own destiny. And you could even see that nowadays of this SNS revival that's going on in the Discord. You have people that just have this love. They're going to write this. They have a passion for it. And they're going to do it no matter what life hits them. It does seem as though, yeah. I, I, long ago, I think, at the introduction to one of uh, the um, anthologies that Andrew Offit edited, Swords Against Darkness. In, 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 in one of those, in one of the introductions, he said, it seemed to him that, that damn near everybody who read Sword and Sorcery was trying to write Sword and Sorcery to better. <laughs> or, or worse effect, but yeah, it, it does seem as though there's an exceptionally loyal um, group of readers. There's uh, that has expanded notably over the past few years. I mean, tw twenty years ago there was nothing like this, and, and it's just cool to see sword and sorcery survive. Um, I'm glad I lived to see it. It's awesome. Well, twenty years ago is when I started getting into what used to be the SF Reader forum, which is this Discord is the modern version of that, but it was just like a chat forum uh but i met most of the people I, in fact half of the people in this book are from my meeting them there uh because they wrote introduced me to the passion that existed then but that was way uh that was way down low huh you know um then there was a lull a lot of these guys didn't write it anymore uh steve goble went on to mysteries he's got a fine publishing career in mysteries um lee child type thrillers uh nathan meyer writes uh other things you know a lot of these guys left sword and sorcery behind um and enticing them back into getting getting into this anthology was one of my challenges as well and i'm very grateful that they were willing to to uh step back and they've all enjoyed it at least they're all telling me they've enjoyed revisiting what they used to write um but yeah there's a heavy passion there uh there's a heavy exploration going on uh howard andrew jones's deal uh, bane stepping forward trying to put out a bunch of sword and sorcery novels um if these click you know you got a you got a well-known uh, publishing house with a long history of military appeal uh pushing out sword and sorcery and if they can get those same readers to buy into it i think it's a win-win well they burned themselves out 
happen. They, they, in the, there was so much of it in the seventies that, you know, inspired by Howard and a lot of it was, you know, there were a lot more paperbacks in, there were a lot more places to publish then. Like, um, there was, um, uh, fantastic magazine, uh, which was a companion to amazing magazine, but fantastic published a lot of Michael Moorcock and many of other, and it was just so much of it. And, and, and a lot of it was good, but a lot more of it wasn't good and it burned itself out. And I think it took a few years for people to kind of look through the, the smoldering runes and say, Oh, wow, there's some good stuff here. And here's the core of this. And I think you're getting a lot of people that are excited about that. I, I'm that way about Edgar Rice Burroughs, you know, and it's that sort of thing is just that that's talk about dead as the dodo that, that, that is it. But, uh, and, and some of the things you get to, and there's not a lot more you can do with them if you're trying to keep them what they were originally. You have to start saying, I love this stuff, but they've done it, and I want to do something different with it. On the other hand, there will always be people who want the more traditional stuff, and I say more power to them. And the more you're driven to do something, and that's what you've just got to do, then I'm, I'm with you, you know? I think our modern age has become very cynical. For example, the John Carter of Mars series, right? Yeah, imagine if that Mars series came out today, people would be like, well, that's not how Mars looks like. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, that, that's part of it is that, you know, a lot of uh, time has, has taken care of, uh, you know, his Mars. It doesn't exist, but it exists in my head somewhere. It's an alternate universe. And and I do think it's dated. I, I, I think that if you're going to write that, and I've, I've written a couple of pastiches. I, I actually finished a Tarzan book for the Edgar Rice Burroughs Company that Burroughs had not finished. He left it in the safe and they hired me to finish it. And I had a great time doing it. Uh, and I wrote an original Tarzan novella and a John Carter Mars short story. And I wrote some pastiches for myself, none of which I think broke any new ground. And the world is not better for my having written them, but I don't think it's any worse off either. Hey, uh, Joe, did you write any Carson up here? I actually like him better than John Carter. I don't like him better than John Carter. He's a poser. But I did, I did, uh, <laughs> I did read those. I read all of those, and, and I wouldn't be adverse to writing in that universe. The, the problem is, is used to, you go, you do a Tarzan novel. Wow, that's cool. But now a Tarzan novel is almost a giveaway because nobody really has, there's a, there's a core. Yeah. You know, one of my great moments was uh, earlier this year, I went out to Tarzana, and I just wanted to see where Burroughs had worked. You know, Tarzana used to be his ranch. Now yeah. it's a town, a city. And there was, I found out the office was still there, and it turned out that we called a number, and the lady inside knew me. We had met at a, a Burroughs convention, and so they let me in. I got my picture taken sitting behind Burroughs' desk and, and all of that. But for me, there will never be that magic again. That is the finest moment in my life. It's comics and then finding uh, John Carter of Mars and, and Tarzan and all those, and uh, you know that will be with me forever. Burroughs is amazingly influential. You're, Mr. Lansdale, you're not alone. I mean, you, like everyone from Ray Bradbury to Carl Sagan has basically stepped yeah. up and said that Burroughs was foundational in their in the growth of their imagination. And, yeah, yeah, right on. I, 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 I read. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. An awful lot of the folks of the 20th century, you know, they, they, he was like a companion of their youth. You know, with, yes, that's a good way of putting look. it. I like that. Could I ask Mr. Lansdale some fanish questions? Sure, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> Do you mind, Mr. Lansdale? You, your 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 work's commonly cited for being um, uh, really amusing, being funny, being hilarious. Um, I can honestly say, uh, I'm old and gray, I've read an awful lot. No one has ever made me laugh harder on the printed page than yourself. Um, you're probably the only author ever who made me laugh so hard I put the book down in order to just sit there and <laughs> laugh for a while, which is pretty awesome, you know. But it's also, it's what what strikes me is like a guy who, you know, writes adventure stories, you know, you, you there's plenty of action in, in your um, in your tales. And I think you might, I think people look at the hilarity and see that primarily when, what well, I'm obviously, I'm an old school pulp fan, and I'm looking for the action. Um, you've written a couple action sequences that, really knocked me over. Um, I recently read Rusty Puppy, which climaxes in a in a one-on-one -on -one between Hap and Leonard, where they are forced in a forced combat one against the other. Um, 
I did some martial arts. My my dad was in, was uh, was an instructor, and that is just a beautifully described you know back and forth between the two doing battle. Um, that was awesome. Also, do you I, you wrote a, there's in Vanilla Ride there's a two chapter running gunfight and uh, car chase, which when I read it. I was sitting on my couch, and when I was done with it, I was standing in my living room. I have no real recollection of how when I got to my feet. That was one exciting damn scene. Now, I've, I've read a bazillion action sequences, and I just wondered, you know, hilarity aside, um, when you sit down to do a, a, a sequence like that, um, do you plot it out in advance? Does it co- come to you as it as it rolls along? Um, how, how do you how do you place action scenes in your work? Um, how do you how do you view them, and how do they come to you? I'm not aware of doing them until I do them. You know, I, I, I don't plot stuff and I don't make charts and I don't make, I, I sometimes make a note, you know, don't forget his eyes are blue <laughs> or something. And I'll put that on a, a envelope or I'll put it at the end of the chapter. I'll, I'll have like a little list of things. Go back and check this and make sure he had his pants back on and, you know, and uh, things like that. But that's about it. What, what I find for me is I learned early on that the only way I could be, you know, you know one thing is that when I first started writing, we're talking about it, I always enjoyed it, but there was a misery in the sense that I couldn't let it go. And I would think about it all day long and it was just overwhelming. I said, you know, this is no way to live. I can't do it this way. I just want to do it when I'm working on it. And so I started thinking more subconsciously. And I, I, and I think martial arts helped me do that. Like I say, I've been doing it a long time. I, I founded my own system. It's in the United States Martial Arts Hall of Fame and all that stuff. So I had that sort of focus, and I I decided that subconsciously I might be plotting, I might be making lists and charts, but I was unaware of it, and that's the way I wanted it. And I would just go to bed at night, and when I'd get up in the morning, by the time I got on my shoes and went to make my coffee, I was already cooking. And so I would have my coffee, and I still do it, and I come up here, I I take, feed the dog, I, I, I take take him out and do the stuff that you do normally and I come up and I go okay and I put my fingers on the keys and it just it comes you know some days are a little slower than others a little harder than others but mostly it's just that way it's like I plot in my sleep I think and when I wake up it's there and I also try not to overthink anything so that it'll feel fresher and I've been in a lot of fights growing up you know, and I've done a lot of sparring and I did a lot of, I did boxing too and all sorts of things, kickboxing, you know, the whole, whole schmear. So when I write those scenes, I feel like I'm, I'm trying to capture that. I'm not afraid to go a little beyond the reality some, from time to time to make it fun, but I stay within the context of what I have done or had done to me. <laughs> and so I try to do that. And as for the other, I think that probably cinema and comics had tremendous influences on me as well as books because the films i when i see things i see them very cinematically and and i think that that comes from that and i think comics gave me the art from it gave me those you know visions of what i wanted to do and so and i'm a great fan of of art in general and i think i borrow from all those things to write that stuff and then my attitude life is pretty funny anyway so it just blends into it and i try to find philosophical moments and social moments and those things go in too and i've had people say well you don't want to get anything about social movements in or you know and i never say i'm doing that i but it goes in because i it's it's important to me and i don't give a damn about anybody else when i'm writing like I always say, when I finish, I hope people love it. But I just, like I say, I write like everybody I know is dead because it's the only way I can get it done to get it done right. But, you know, the action, uh, it's, I, th- I think it's just, uh, you know, something that I've learned to do subconsciously. I, but I don't, no, but you asked about plotting and I don't do that, no. Okay, well, it's, it's, that's, that's tremendous. It's, you keep, yeah, that, you. As someone who tries to write, that's really enviable that you could just you know, let it percolate overnight and then put it right onto the, uh, onto the laptop. Well, I to do it. it took me about 10 or 15 years to, to be able to, to do it just that easily. And the main problem wasn't that I was... I quit plotting and stuff real early because it didn't work for me. I found... I, I did one trick that worked for me early on was I would find newspaper articles that were totally different, that were interesting, and I would say, how could those connect? And I would do that off and on until finally my mind just got to where it could connect things that didn't normally seem 
like they would connect. And then I dropped doing that because it, it was it was too artificial. But uh, then I gradually dropped plotting because it was working for me. And I don't think I'm so much a plotter as I'm a storyteller. I grew up with people who told stories. I grew up reading, you know, Twain, all, um, Burroughs, all of these great pure storytellers. And I think that I think of myself as a storyteller that has style. <laughs> Yep. That, that's a good term actually because that that's that's what i look for i look for storytellers and i think all the people that i gathered in neither beg nor yield are storytellers and good ones i wanted to kind of ask you guys this one thing because obviously this is a this is a short story anthology but there's this quote i hear kill your darlings basically when you're like doing world building and there's something you really want to add but it just doesn't work it drags too long it kills the pace and you got to remove it and uh, john did you ever have to deal with something like that that's i want to reflect for a moment uh, mr lansdale brought up um gold medal originals um the the yeah. mystery mystery paperbacks of the 50s and 60s even stretching oh. into the 70s um the reading those um are it's like a class in writing streamlined sleek unpadded fiction absolutely and, absolutely yeah, and, yeah, and one of the, one of the things that tr that m most annoyed me about about a lot of fiction that I'd read was that occasionally the author would just sort of veer off from the story a little bit and put in the stuff that he should have killed. Um, that is discursive material in there. Maybe maybe that's you know maybe it's there just to make the book longer because the longer novels are in style. Um, when writing myself, I try to I try to keep I try to keep that to an absolute minimum. You want to strip the padding out. Um, this doesn't mean you reduce color. Doesn't mean you reduce character. Doesn't mean you reduce action. You just make sure that you that what's in there has a purpose. This it's obviously it's difficult to adhere to. I remember um, I read there was an anecdote about the the editor of Black Mass, Captain Joseph Shaw, um, had a had a paragraph written by Raymond Chandler, and he and when he had authors in, he would give them the, that paragraph and say, edit it, cut it, and they would be unable to do so. That that that's like a that's like, that's like a diamond distilled you know example of. No padding at all. So there's a guy who didn't have to kill his darlings, or if he did, he did it so effectively you you, you can't see the padding. It's not there. Um, so yeah, I'm aware of that as I write. Um, I think the temptation to uh, you get from especially like historical novelists or those writing or those writing pastiche is that you've done a lot of research, you've got a lot of familiarity with that era, and you want to put, you want the reader to uh, sh you want to share it. You want the reader to know exactly how much you know about it, but. Too much of that in the wrong place, and it's it's superfluous. It, it's it blunts the edge of the narrative, and you don't want that. Yeah, I, I think uh, I was thinking about Chandler. I was, you know, she was the kind of blonde that make a bishop kick a hole in a stained glass window. Yeah. You that know, kind uh, of a blonde. Uh, when, when, once once he said that, you didn't need any more descriptions of that. Blonde. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was beautiful. Um, you know, and L.A. had all the personality of a paper cup. <laughs> <laughs> as inconspicuous so he, as a tarantula on a slice of really, angel food yeah it was great every damn thing every book of his you read is just full of stuff but um i, I think when the kill your darlings the, the exact quote is usually given somewhat to faulkner but it really goes back to elizabethan times but it was more specifically designed for a line that you thought was so wonderful and so descriptive that and is and it is but it doesn't fit I know I've had to, to do this morning. I was looking as as I was writing, I'd go back and I'd go, oh, that's good. I don't want to lose that. But what's that telling me? That's not telling me shit. So that had to go. And I always figure if I can write it once, I'll come up with another one, you know, I, I, that I can do. But you, you have to be willing to. Do you cut it and save it for another time or you just delete it? Oh, oh I just cut it. And, oh, uh, save it. I, just, I save it. I'll have it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I. I probably should. No, I don't know, but I, I just cut it because another one will come. You know, there'll always be a new one. You know, if I can play that note once, I'll find some variation on, on right. the theme. You know? Oh, oh, I did have one other thing: is the gold medal novels really do teach you how to write novels, and then you can make them crime or whatever. But really, they're just teach you how to write a good novel, and then you can uh, extrapolate and go in any direction you want. The, the thing I was going to say about, you know, not going off on tangents, there are times when that works, and you can learn that from Mark Twain. If you read Huckleberry Finn, he couldn't stay on horse 
No, yeah, with a gun to his head. And he even says, if you're looking for a plot, you know, at the first of it, you know, they will be, readers will be shot. Right. But the thing is, is that he does everything in that book and he's brilliant, but he's such a great storyteller that he doesn't go off giving you just information. But what he does, he's very smart in that he can go off and tell you other tales. And before you know it, you're interested in that one. And then you're back to the original and you don't feel like you've lost a beat. Yeah. Um, that, you know. Well, the rest of us are not Mark Twain. <laughs> yeah, Jason, you obviously also write. Do you also so, so, uh, agree with that sort of that mind when you write your Derek short stories? Yeah, no, I want to concentrate on these guys, but uh, yeah, 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 I'm yeah. still that's still a struggle I have. Uh, like Joe described it, it may be the most beautiful sentence in my mind, and I'm reluctant to get rid of it, but I know it needs to go because. You know, especially oh, read your stuff out loud. Uh, I tell people all the time, if, if read it out loud. If you have a long section that bores you mentally while you're reading it, or if you stumble over it, your readers will. It's got to go or get reworded. <clears throat> if you keep coming back to that section every time you read it, that you read it, oh, there's nothing wrong. That's really good. But, but you start it over. <laughs> and you keep yep. coming back. Yeah. Because it needs to be cut or revised. And usually, the other, th the other thing you can find in, in, in writing is that most of the time, if you cut something, it, it improves it. And Ernest Hemingway had a thing that he would say about the iceberg theory. I'm sure everybody's heard of it, but was that the tip of the iceberg is what you saw. But if you wrote correctly, that you would sense what was beneath the water. And it meant that you could take things out that you had put in and the reader would sense it. They may not really understand exactly what you, but they would sense that feeling that was there. And I think, I think that's true because I think the words, whether you mean to or not, the words hint at things you don't even know you're hinting at. And by picking the right word, not its second cousin, you come closer to giving that impression of, of something else, you know, being there that you don't have to tell. Hemingway was the master. If you read Big Two-Hearted River or you read Hills Like White Elephants, uh, ki The Killers, uh, The Battler, any of those, you go, well, how in the hell did he do that? Why am I trying to write? You know, this guy really had it. He knew exactly what to leave, what to take out, and it's a master class in writing. And the other thing is read outside of your interest. If you love Sword and Sorcery, by golly, read it, but read other stuff. Otherwise, you'll just be copying other people, and it becomes incestuous, and you don't really have other influences, so you don't know they're there. So, you know, Flannery O'Connor, Carson McCullers, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and all the classics, and then they're modern writers, too. I don't mean just concentrate on the older ones, but those guys are classics for a reason. Even Melville, who gives you a course on how whaling works <laughs> right in the middle of the novel, I found all that fascinating, but... It, it wouldn't make a great modern novel, but yeah. it's a it's a it's a tremendous novel that took me five times to get into. But once I got to Queequeg and that, uh, you know, in the with with all of the tattoos and I, I knew I was uh, I knew I was in. You actually touched on the point about reading uh, uh, like a variety of stuff when I when I started trying to write SNS. The big mistake, and I learned this very quickly right after I finished my first story, was that. I came into it just as a fantasy fan. You gotta, I think, it, it, especially that it is it is so rooted into the culture of uh, of pulp fiction. You, you gotta, in a way, read other other authors also in that in that in that space and in that time. Yeah, you know, we, we used to, when people said pulp, it was an insult. So I'm still not comfortable with being called a pulp writer because when I was growing up, pulp meant crap. That didn't mean all pulp was crap. Crap, but it meant most of it was. There were, there were, you know, there were fewer Ray Bradburys and Raymond Chandlers and Dashiell Hammetts and people like that than one wants to imagine. I went back and really read a lot of old pulp stuff, and I thought, oh my God, this is just dreadful. So what you do is you want to take the best pulp writers, who in fact were not good pulp writers; they were good writers yeah. who used that furniture of pulp. And, uh, you know, you have people like, like I mentioned before, those are what's thought of as literary writers. But the bottom line is there shouldn't be a difference, really. You're, you're trying to write the best you know how to give the same attributes to your fiction and to be able to have readers have some echo after reading it, you know, that they feel like they hear that echo. And uh, I've read a lot of things I liked. But six months later, I may not have remembered them. But the other things that really meant something to me, I can I can still hear, hear that reverberation. You know. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Well said. 
Good point. Good point. And what Joe said about having the right word and not a second cousin. You you do you learn that by reading. You have to expand your reading yeah. and learn other ways to say things. What's what's new with you and how where can people find you and stuff like that? Um I have a, a new collection of stories out right now that called uh, Things Get Ugly, and they certainly do. Uh, it's a collection, they call it the best of my crime stories, but some of them could have been horror stories or whatever. But um, some of my stuff is hard to define, so I let them define it, you know. And uh, so that's out right now. I think today is the day it actually came out officially. Uh, later in the year, Excuse I have... Uh, beg, beg your pardon. Is there are, is the stories in this collection drawn from throughout your career, or are they more recent? Yes. Oh, they're drawn throughout my career. Some of them are recent, but but they're uh, they're they're throughout my entire career from the probably starting in the '80s. I think starting in the '80s up until now, and I think it's one of the best of my collections. But it is a dark dude, man. Let me tell you. And then my novel, The Donut Legion, from um, Little Brown Mulholland, is out right now. And then Subterranean is doing a collection called The Senior Girls Bayonet Drill Team this fall. And uh, I'm writing a memoir right now, which I'm about two-thirds through. I've paused to uh, take care of a couple of uh, obligations, but it's stories that I'm, short stories, in fact, and an introduction I promised to write. But I'll probably go back to that. I, previously, I just turned in a new Happen Leonard novel called Sugar on the Bones. Yes. And uh, so... That's where I am right now. Yeah, that's awesome. What What about you, John? Where What are you working on, and where can people find you? I'm harder to locate. Um, mm. uh, Titan Books is supposed to reissue a duology with both my uh, Conan pastiches on board. Uh, Conan the Emerald Lotus, published a couple times many years ago, and Conan and the Living Plague, which has been supposedly published to, like two, three times and fought, died on the doorstep each time. Um, would, in theory, that should finally be available. I think last I heard it was it's been put off for about a year. I look forward to it finally appearing. Well, I won't, I'm not going to believe it until I hold it in my hands. Um, but yeah, that's you. Could, with any luck, you'll finally be able to read that if you care to read it. I have uh, short stories due to appear in. Uh, um, there's a weird book. It's got a yearbook coming up. Uh, it's got a got a good story of mine in it. And uh, Tales from Magician's Skull. I think issue twelve. Should have another story about Jason's favorite character, Ben Hus. Um, that, that that's a good time too. I'm currently, like I said, working away at a novel. I don't know if I can finish it, if it's any good, or if it'll be published. But I'm going to finish it. I swear. And that, that's about the archivist, right? Archivist. Yes. Yeah, a, a character that I believe I met you through way back on the SF Reader and Flashing Swords. Yes, indeed. Invented that character for Flashing the Flashing Swords Ezine, and he's still around, low twenty five years later, still trying to find his way. Jason, where, where can people find you? Just the usual, uh, the Rogue Blades website. Uh, I hang around here. I send everyone to the Discord. I say, for Sword and Sorcery, this is the conversation place to be now. I'm not totally on any of the other social networks. Uh, I, I'm, I have friends pushing the book uh, on, on places I'm not. Thank you, Joe, very much for hosting the cover reveal last week. Um, yes. But... Uh, Nope, I'm going to just keep reading and trying to write and submit stuff out there. So hopefully I'll be be eventually known for my writing, uh, at least uh, up there with my editing. I do need to, add, I need to thank my daughter a lot for the hosting of that stuff because she got it done. You know, I said, yeah. I need to get this done. So she did it for me, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate her. Yep. Well, yeah. Well. Well, thank you guys. Uh, th thank you for giving me this chance. Uh, hopefully, it wasn't too rusty, but um, oh, it was enjoyable. Yeah, it was very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. I love to talk to these guys. You know, it's it's great to hear them talk and their opinions, and I liked it. Yeah, yeah that's a, a real a real pleasure, guys. Yeah, to talk to you, Mr. Lansdale. It's a rare rare opportunity. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you.